In this video, we're going to look at the concept of background genetics, and we're also going to discuss mutation versus species-derived genes. Welcome to the Art of Breeding with Brian Reeder. Background genetics. What do we mean by that? Background genetics means the many accrued genes that are specific to a specific gene group. So whether that is a breed or a species or whatever that may be, once something is in isolation for a given period of time, it starts to gather unique minor mutations, minor modifiers, minor genes that change and affect the way the major genes work. Now, I'm drastically simplifying this concept of background genetics, but in other words, it's all the complementary genes that make a wolf a wolf. A wolf and a coyote are closely related, and they're going to share most of their genes. What makes the difference in a wolf and a coyote? Well, there will be several major genes that make a difference, but the biggest difference in the two has actually come from how the genes they have in common, the vast majority of their genome, are being modified and mediated and translated into proteins. So in other words, the RNA, the transcription factors, are going to have a huge influence on how those genes are functioning. Now honestly, between those two species, coyote and wolf, much of the, of the background genetics are even going to be very, very similar, but they're not going to be exactly the same. This is going to be the same in almost any situation. So whether it's green jungle fowl and red jungle fowl, whether it's gray jungle fowl and red jungle fowl, whether it's corn snake and black rat snake, or whether it's king snake, California king snake, or eastern black king snake, whether it's uh, California king snake and pine snake. Each of these, even though they share most of their genes, are still going to have a unique collection that they have accrued of these minor genes and modifiers that create their background genetics. When we make a hybrid of two different species or subspecies that are quite separated, one of the things that we're going to see is that the genes don't combine correctly always because of the differences in background genetics. And that's the reason when we see things like sterility, when we see things like deformities or physical problems that occur in some hybrids, the further they are from each other, the more distantly genetically related they are, the longer they've been separated in evolutionary time, the more changes will have occurred in their genome and the more different their background genes have become so that they end up with very different background genetics. So for instance, in the big three North American colubrids, in the pine snakes and gopher snakes, the pituophus, in the rat snakes, um, the pantherophus, in the king snakes and milk snakes, the lampropeltis. They will all breed and produce fertile offsprings when crossed. However, the lampropeltis, the king snakes and milk snakes, and the pituophus, the bull snakes and pine snakes and gopher snakes, are the most distantly related in an evolutionary sense and they're the, the two genus, if that's what they are, where we see any problems when they're crossed. If there's any infertility, it's going to be between those two. If there's any deformities or problems in the neonates, it's going to be between those two. Though it's very, very low even between them. Whereas the rat snakes do not show that problem when crossed to the pituophus or crossed to the lampropeltis. 100% fertility, never any deformities. That is a reflection of background genetics. But background genetics also, let's look at them in jungle fowl. So a good example of the background genetics is that in the red jungle fowl, they have dark skin on their legs. Their scales have dark coloring. They're slate gray. That is because they have dermal melanin because they do not carry the gene that we call the inhibitor of dermal melanin. The green jungle fowl, on the other hand, does have the inhibitor of dermal melanin, and they carry a gene that we in chickens call fibromelanosis. In that background, 
in the green jungle fowl, all that gene does is create a blue patch on the face, which is actually an area of white skin that is being affected by the fibromelanosis gene that turns it blue. It does the exact same thing in chickens if there is white, if there's a white earlobe or a white face. Put fibromelanosis with a white face or a white earlobe, and that will turn it blue. Um, if there is the inhibitor of dermal melanin, it will turn those areas blue, this gene will, but it will not affect the skin. But if there is no inhibitor of dermal melanin so that you can have dark skin, what the fibromelanotic gene does is turn the whole body, the skin and the muscle, and even the bone, in some instances where they're homozygote and they have all their modifiers in place, black. Now, that is not seen in the green jungle fowl, but it is seen when the green jungle fowl genetics are brought into the red jungle fowl. That's a difference in background genetics. That's one very, very simple example dealing with one single major gene, or actually with two single ma major genes, the inhibitor of dermal melanin, its presence or absence, and the fibromelanosis gene. However, this will be occurring on much, much grander levels because as we talked about in the genetics um, video that I did a few videos back, we have this multigenic, polygenic thing going on where there are major genes and then a whole bunch of minor genes. This is quantitative genetics, and that's what creates the different background is there will be different a few, some different major genes between two species, but then there will be a lot of different minor genes that are influencing how specific genes are functioning, even when it's the same gene between the two species. So those differences in background genetics can cause a lot of the issues that we see, but they also allow for the emergence of unique phenotypes that are not seen in either of the progenitor species in the later generation hybrids. Like I said in the last couple of videos, sometimes the F1 hybrid will show something that looks unique, but that may or may not be reproducible. It may simply be the result of chromosomal misalignments, chromosomal mismatches, or it may be the result of heterozygosity. However, in later generation hybrids, several things can happen. The chromosomes can realign properly so that they are more functional. Uh, mismatches can be straightened out. Sometimes a thing happens where you have a gene from one progenitor and a gene from another progenitor, and in the F1 hybrid, they're mismatched, and so they don't link up. But in later generation hybrids, you get a result where you can have both versions of the gene because they're mismatched, but now through segregation, you get examples where it's heterozygote, uh, where it's a homozygote for both of those. That's a really interesting thing that can produce unique phenotypes. And then you can also bring together combinations of these background genes into unique forms. And that is what creates breeds. That's how you go from a green jungle fowl and a red jungle fowl to a Bekazar to X number of generations later, the breed that we call silky or the breed that we call white face black Spanish or the breed that we call Lagrans or you what whatever breed it may be that that has that particular kind of origin that's the origination of that or the long-tailed fowl they're descending from from Bekazar so by combining these background genetics you know background genetics can stop the function that we normally see in a, in one or the other of the progenitors in the hybrids it can accentuate that it can accentuate the trait coming from one or the others, or it can allow unique combinations. And it is the ironing out, as I call it, the realigning, which is actually bringing to homozygosity, making selection for specific background genes and specific major genes that combine in a specific way and then become stabilized. Stabilization is where in later generations you have selected to where you have the individuals that are homozygous for the background genes and the major genes that you want them to have. Those can be phenotype genes in the sense of the way they look. Those can be behavioral genes. Those can be um, genes for function such as egg production or meat production or temperament. So there's all of these genes and you can select one way or the other. And so that's something you want to consider when you're breeding 
is do you want to do you want to select for behavior so like in snakes are you selecting for calmer snakes if you make hybrids are you using a superior animal on one side that has better behavior because you're going to bring in color from this alternate animal and you're going to bring in behavior and function like good egg production or neonates that feed well from the other animal so an example would be do you want coloring coming from milk snakes but you want behavioral traits coming from corn snakes You know, you can select for all of that in later generations and stabilize the versions you want. But it's also these differences in background genetics are also can uh, what can make first generation hybrids and uh, the early generations of the later generation hybrids seem like kind of segregating messes that are all over the map. And people say, oh, they're just much. You can't pick anything. You can never get back to anything. Well, it it takes a while. You've got to apply a lot of selection. You've got to do a lot of breeding. You need to raise a fair number so you get the segregations you want. But within a few generations, you'll start to see certain things taking form, even if you're not applying a lot of selection to them. You'll start to see certain certain phenotypes physically, uh, visually, and behaviorally getting set in the line. But if you then apply selection, and a good tool for doing that then is to back cross in the direction you want, you can bring in a phenotype gene from one side while keeping it on the preferable background genes for behavior from the other side. This brings me to the final point that I want to touch on in this video, which is the difference between mutation and species-derived genes. So we say in all of these different breed groups, uh, a new look will arise, and we say, oh, so-and-so got a mutation. Oh, there was a new mutation for albino. There was a new mutation for a new kind of recessive white. There was a new mutation for a new type of orange flower, whatever it is. And yes, mutations occur. They do occur in captive populations. Sometimes that mutation was already being carried by the wild population. Sometimes it actually mutated in captivity. Both things happen. But sometimes that is a species-derived gene that is coming from one or the other of the ancestor species and hybrids. A good example is the fibromelanotic gene. If you just looked at green jungle fowl, you would not think they have fibromelanosis unless you really thought about those blue earlobes and had good experience with breeding fibromelanosis and knowing what it looked like when you get it combined with the inhibitor of dermal melanin. That is an example of a species-derived gene that previously people would say, oh, well, fibromelanosis is a, is a mutation in the domestic population. Well, no, it's not. It is in the green jungle fowl. It's a jungle fowl-derived gene that functions a different way in the red jungle fowl-derived background. And so it's not a mutation. It's a species-derived gene. Now, in reptiles, let's say you have... um, corn snakes that you've never hybridized anything into them. They're just corn snakes as pure as they were when they came from the wild, whatever purity level that actually is. And you get an albino or you get a mutation for leucicism or whatever mutation you get. Well, maybe that's a mutation. Maybe it was already carried by the wild population and you've just combined the right individuals so that you can see that the mutation was already present. Both things can happen. doesn't really matter in the end, but I just want you to know that both things are possible. When you start hybridizing, though, you can see species-derived genes emerge that you would not have recognized as such in the ancestral background because it's not behaving that way in that set of background genetics. But when you put it in combination with the other set of background genetics, this is what it turns into, and this is the look you get in the hybrid, and you can select that up in later generation hybrids. Thank you for visiting my channel. I hope this video was interesting to you. If you would like to know more about this subject, Leave a comment or question below in the comments section. Please leave a like on this video and subscribe to the channel. Click the bell notification to be alerted when new videos post. You can find my poultry books on Amazon at the link below in the show notes. My Daylily website, sundragondaylilies.com, 
offers information on booking me for consultations on your specific genetics questions or mentoring for your breeding projects. It also lists all of my daylily introductions, the cultivars that are currently available, and links to my blog where you can find the bulk of my daylily writing. Thank you for joining me for this video, and I hope you'll be back for more. Have a great day.